when the Nazis were looking for Jews, they would go house to house. And they were aware that most of the Jews were being hidden by Christians. And after a while, the Christians obviously understood that the uh, Nazis now were coming in disguise. They knew that there were wolves in sheep's clothing. And so they would ask a question. How does Psalm 166 begin? How does Psalm 166 begin? And we all know that there's, only, there's not 166 Psalms. But it's interesting, and it came back to me when Carl read from Psalm 100 this morning, that Psalm 100 and Psalm 66 begin in exactly the same way. If, uh, if you're new here, my name's Nigel Huff. I'm a crocodile farmer. So that makes it obvious the reason why I get invited to preach from God's Word. <laughs> but fortunately, you, you'll be pleased to know that Doug and Carl and Simon give me a very specific mandate. They agree with Martin Luther. The words of men disappear like the mist, but the words of God are set in stone. What we come here this morning is to come to God's word, to hear from God. We need to drown out the voice of the crocodile farmer and hear the word of God by the spirit of God. God's word is objective truth. Isn't it amazing that he's given us his word to us? The unchanging word written over 1,500 years by 40 authors, 66 books, yet amazing unity, absolute authority, always claiming to be the Word of God. And it survived 3,500 years, and it's unchanging as we come this morning. Before we even start, I want to say we're going through the book of Acts, and I've come to Acts chapter 20, and I'm in verse 13. And let me just read the opening couple of verses for you. We went ahead, we went on ahead to the ship and sailed for Assos, where we were going to take Paul aboard. He had made this arrangement because he was going there on foot. When he met us at Assos, we took him aboard and went on to Mytilene. The next day we set sail from there and arrived off Chios. The same day after that we crossed over to Samos, And on the following day, we arrived in Miletus. Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus to avoid spending time in the province of Asia, for he was in a hurry to reach Jerusalem, if possible, by the day of Pentecost. I mean, quite obviously, this is an introduction to where we're going to go. Paul's going to be talking, uh, giving a farewell speech to the Ephesians, the Ephesian leaders. But before that, we have this almost geography lesson. Now, if God created all of the world, if he's absolutely sovereign, if there's no limit to his power, if his wisdom is beyond what we can imagine, then surely in his word to us, his geography would be accurate, his history would be accurate, and his science would be accurate. The Bible is not a book about history, geography, or science. But in the Bible, we find in an amazing way over the years that it's in line with geography and history and science. Sometimes we as Christians make mistakes and we interpret it in the wrong ways. We might say things like the, the world's flat, but the Bible doesn't change. Right from the beginning, it says the Spirit of God hovered over the circle of the earth. God knew what the shape of the earth was. He wasn't taken by surprise. In all of his words, that he spoke through men to us, it's accurate. But obviously, primarily, the word of God is to nourish your and my soul. And that's why we come to it this morning. Before we begin this morning, I hope that you would join with me as we pray. Lord, again, thank you for your word to us that has been preserved through the ages. Where we are wrong, please change us. Where you want us to go, please take us. And what you want us to understand, please expose to us this morning. Amen. So I'm hoping that you've all got your Bibles, because we're going to be following it closely. And we're going to be focusing on verses 17 to the end. 
If you've got them there, let's read along together. From Miletus, Paul went to Ephesus. So he sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. When they, when they arrived, he said to them, You know how I lived the whole time I was with you. From the first day I came into the province of Asia. I served the Lord with great humility and with tears, although I was severely tested by the plots of the Jews. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly from house to house. I've declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardship are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me, if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore I declare to you today I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you, night and day, and with tears. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all of those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work we must help the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself when he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. When he had said this, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. I don't know about you, but when I look at this part of scripture, to me it's all about leadership. What you've got is Paul, who came into a place called Ephesus, where there was no church, and he established a church. He was the one who implemented the leadership. He put in place overseers, pastors. He put those in place so that there would be a church and that it would be strong. And when he was kicked out of the town, he sent his spiritual son Timothy there. So when we read the two books of Timothy and what, Timothy, what Paul is saying to Timothy, he's talking specifically about this church of Ephesus. And we see in the epistle to the Ephesians, he, he has a, a lot of emotion for this church. In many ways, it's his church that he's established, of course under God. But this is more than just any old church. And so now we come to this point where where he is, he's going back to Jerusalem for the last time. We know history that he's going to be sent from there to Rome where he's going to die. And this is the last time that he's going to meet these leaders, and it's him handing over the baton to them. And in two ways, he's telling them what to do. He's saying, by my example, you've seen what I do. And on top of that, I'm telling you what you must do going, going forward. So to me, and I don't know, yeah, I, I, you know, you must decide yourselves, but this is a part of scripture that refers to leadership and its instructions to us. Don't you find it extraordinary that this is 2,000 years ago and yet the principles that he applies are so relevant to us this morning as we sit here. We live in a world that's dysfunctional and I think primarily because there's bad leadership. Whether we're in the family or we're in the church, or we're in our businesses, or we're in a country. What we can see is how toxic bad leadership can be. We can also see how good and what a blessing good leadership is. 
And we have instructions in the Bible that very clearly tell us as Christians how we should be leaders. Now I know that specifically it's to the elders of that church, and in a way this is a, a sermon that's specifically to the elders of our church. But the reality is, is that everybody who's in this room is a leader in one way or another. You're either leading your family, or you're leading your classroom, or you're leading your business, or you may be in another form of leadership. And what we find in the Bible is this double honor around leadership and a double chastisement around bad leadership. It is a good thing, Paul says, that you should desire to be a leader, but be careful because when you're a bad leader, there's double chastisement. But at the same time, when you're a good leader, the impact of your leadership flows through to everybody. You salt and light in your community. You change communities. You change families. And there's a double honor in being a leader. And so all of you who are present this morning, you're all leaders. And I'm here as God's messenger to say to you, be warned when you lead badly. Be honored when you lead well. When you lead well. Take it very seriously. We can see how much damage it can cause. We can see how much good it can bring. Now, when we come to this, I just want to direct your attention just briefly to verse 28, because I think this is a pivotal verse. Sorry. Verse 28. Keep watch over yourselves and all of the flock which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. I think there's a, princi a principle that runs throughout scriptures that the starting point of leadership is always looking at the man in the mirror. That's where we start. If God wants, if, if you want to be a good leader in God's hands, essentially what you've got to do is become a good person. And I, I think that what happens after that is that Paul gives us four principles. Obviously, there are more, but four very important principles that help us to become good leaders. And the first of that is right at the beginning. He says, You know how I lived the whole time I was with you. From the first day I came into the province of Asia, I served the Lord with great humility, with tears, although I was severely tested. You know... Paul says, you know, I came and I lived amongst you. I was transparent. You saw what I taught. I sorry, you heard what I taught. You saw how I lived. There wasn't a disconnect by, through, between my words and between my deeds. No, it was open to you. You all saw it. The starting point for a good leader is that you're a blameless leader, that you're a holy leader, that you're transparent. What people hear from you has to be the same as what they see in you. And Paul is saying, I came and I walked among you. You saw me for three years. There I was. I was walking. Did you see a discrepancy between what I said and how I lived? No, you didn't. At the core of a good leader is a blameless leader, is a holy leader, is one who's transparent and who's humble. I feel unbelievably honored in our community that we have good leaders. We have leaders who, where there's no disconnect. What they say and what they do is the same. I think of Kevin and Jill. I've known them for 50 years. I don't suddenly think, well, I'm going to find a different Kevin the next time I see him. When I go to their house, I don't find that Jill's now in a bad mood or, or she's sulking. No, they're the same. We can trust them. That's why we gather around them. That's why we listen to them. That's why they're good leaders. We don't have to go to Paul. It's great to be able to go to Paul. But in our own community, we see these older leaders. I know what I'm going to say next is going to embarrass them. But I've, I've watched Carl and Tess for a long time. There's a reason why young people love to go into their house. I just go there unannounced the whole time. I don't even knock. I just walk in. If you go onto the shelf at the top, there's this red tin. And inside are some, there's some uh, chocolate brownies with coconut in them. I just, I just walk in and I go and take them. Anyway, I do, I do. I mean, Tess will. But I don't go in there and find that suddenly now Tess has gone and joined some kind of cult 
or Carl, he's gone off somewhere else, or they're having a bad mood. There's this amazing consistency. For 40 years, I go into the same house, I meet the same people, and the main things are the main things, and the plain things are the plain things in their life. It's uncomplicated. What they teach and what they live are exactly the same. And Paul is saying that's the heart of good leadership. It's not that you're a dynamic character. It's not that you're charismatic, that you're forceful. It's not even that you're courageous. It's that you're blameless. That you have moral purity. That people can trust you. Jason, their son, was going driving to, to um, Bulawayo, and, and he said to me something that I found really funny. He said, when he was about six years old, which was over 30 years ago, um, Carl and Tess were having an argument about how long they should stay at a certain place. He had never heard them arguing before. He said, I thought they were going to get divorced. <laughs> you see, what's consistent is that they honor each other. They honor God. Their life and their words are consistent. That's the beginning of leadership. We can say the same thing about Andres and Tracy. We can say the same things about Kevin and Jill. We're blessed in this community to have good leadership. Those of us who are younger, <laughs> those of us who are younger, Doug, you and me, <laughs> I mean, we're the ones who must carry that baton. But that's the model of leadership that we must have. It begins with blamelessness. And so he carries on. And he says the next thing that you must have after transparency and humility is you must have integrity and self-sacrifice. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. There's an integrity about Paul, isn't there? There's an integrity about Kevin and Jill. But there's also self-sacrifice. I find it extraordinary how always the people who are self-sacrificing are always the happiest ones in the room. It defies logic, doesn't it? Those people who pour themselves out for other people, they're always happy. I don't ever arrive at, at their house and find that they, they're moping. There's a joy in self-sacrifice. And Paul says that I've given up my life, I've poured it out. I went and saw Scott Marks this week and I said to him, what would be your, the first thing that you would think about if you were talking about leadership? And he said it would be self-sacrifice. He said in, in God's church, the person who leads the best is the one who's prepared to sacrifice the most. He said something else really interesting to me. And I'm hoping that I'm getting the words right because I haven't written it down. But he said, the definition of corruption is whatever it costs you, I don't mind if it's for my betterment or if it benefits me. That's the definition of corruption. The definition of Christ-like leadership, I don't mind whatever it costs me so that it is, makes it better for you. That's what we need in our church is people who self-sacrifice, people who say, I'm prepared to sacrifice myself for the church in this extraordinary way I can say that God makes that person the most joyous person in the room. I don't know how that works. But Paul is saying to us this morning, we need integrity and we need to self-sacrifice if we want to be leaders within our church. And as Christians, leaders anyway. The third thing he says is there needs to be urgency and truth. I ask myself the question, why is the church so valuable? And the answer is very simple. Because Christ paid for it. The most, most valuable commodity in all of our world was used to buy your and my life. The reason that we belong to the church, why we were part of the family of God, has absolutely nothing to do with what we've done, but everything to do with what God did on the, what Jesus did on the cross. I think I, I said it the last time I was here, but at that amazing moment where, where Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The wrath of God on his only son, 
this only time that there's separation in the Godhead. We can't even comprehend the price that was paid for our salvation and for the salvation of the people who are in our church. The reason why there's a great urgency within our church, it's a valuable church. It's been paid for at great price. The Son of God himself died so that the church could survive. You might not like me, but you're going to have to live with me for eternity because I'm going to be a brother, in, or a brother of yours in Christ. And that's why there's an urgency. And there's a great value to the truth. God's written his truth in stone. It's unchanging. I mean, I said it a little bit earlier on with Martin Luther, but it's true, isn't it? The words of men do disappear. The words of God are long-lasting. What is it about the Word of God? You know, it's objective truth. God's written it down. Every single person in the whole world can read this Bible. Why is it different for you and me? What makes it different? Why does it speak to our very souls? Something happens, doesn't it, when we hear God's Word? We feel like it's God speaking to us. The way I like to describe it is as if, if a toddler walked in through the room here, a little baby, we would all see the objective truth. There's a toddler walking in the room. If that was Tess and Carl's grandchild, the subjective reality would be that they would respond in a different way because it's their grandchild. You see, this is what it is about our truth. This is God speaking to me through His Holy Spirit that was given to me when I believed in His Son. Everybody who's a part of the family of God, who's been redeemed by Jesus Christ, is blessed by the Holy Spirit. When we come to this word, there's this subjective emotion that's inside of us because it's God speaking to us His truth. That's why it's so important in this church. The truth central in this church. That's the, the way that this church will go on is it'll be focused on this word. This is everything. This objective reality of God's truth. This is where we focus. If you want to be a leader within God's church, you to be transparent and humble. You show integrity and self-sacrifice. You have an urgency and a truth about you. And finally, you have compassion and you have conviction. You have compassion for people. The, real, the reason why you have compassion is you can say with your hand on your heart, there but for the grace of God go I. The things that I have are a gift from God. My very life was given to me by Him. My salvation, I paid nothing for it. God gave it to me. That is what grace is, an unmerited favor. Everything that I have was given to me by God. My next breath is from God. My next heartbeat is from God. Certainly all my possessions are a gift from God. The place that I have in society is a gift from God. He's given me everything. So when I see people suffering, I have great compassion. I have great compassion for the church as a whole, but I have compassion for people in general. And I have a great conviction that the only way that I can deal with their conviction is looking at their soul. That's the most valuable part of us. That's why Jesus didn't rant and rave about his miracles and all the other things that he did. In fact, he told everybody to be quiet because there's a much more important message. It's the message that concerns your soul. He came here to die for you so that you would have eternal and abundant life. There's only one way to the Father, that's through the Son. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's no other way. We who have a conviction need to be concerned about people, concerned primarily about their souls, and secondly, about their physical conditions. So we have this, where, where Paul is giving us instruction, the first part of it is, is, this is what you should be. You should be blameless. Before, Nigel, you go and preach a sermon, preach to yourself. Your bigger job is that you must, you must clean up your own act. Your secondary job is to go and, and, and preach the sermon. That's my primary responsible, responsibility for everybody in this room. That's your primary responsible, responsibility. 
If you want to be a vessel that is used by God, don't go and practice your oratory skills. Don't try and become more dynamic or more forceful. Go and become more holy. Go and become more blameless. That's the qualification in God's kingdom for leadership. And so now we've come to this, as this is what, what Paul has said, this is what you should be. And now he says to them, and this is what you should do. And the first thing that he says to them is you should feed the flock. Leaders should feed the flock. They should feed them good food. They should feed solid food. They shouldn't get involved in disputable matters. I've said it to you often, we, we must focus on the main things and the plain things. Scripture is very clear on the main and the plain things. There's a reason why it's more obscure than some other things, because God doesn't need it to be so plain. On the plain things, it's very, very clear to all of us. What happened in the Garden of Eden is, is that we turned our back on God, and we were estranged from Him. The reason for the dysfunction in our society is we don't need God. But God in His goodness sent His Son, that those who believe in Him should not perish but have eternal life. These are the main things. These are the things we've got to keep on feeding to our flock. We've got to take them from one good pasture to the next good pasture. We don't take them to the barren land. If we want to be leaders within this church, we take them to new pastures. We make them dig deep into His Word. So that we're a deep church, we're a solid church, we're not swayed by the winds of doctrine. That deep in our heart we believe in this Jesus. And he's revealed to himself to us in this word. And that by his grace he takes us on in sanctification that we become more and more like him both individually and as a community. We deal with the deep things, not the shallow things. We feed our flock good and solid food. We don't take them back to milk. If you want to be a leader, you must go and feed the flock. And then he says to them, he warns them. There are wolves out there. So he feeds, but he also warns. The positive side of leadership, but the negative side of leadership. I'm just warning you, he says to the Ephesians, there are wolves out there. There are wolves on the outside. We're trying to lure you from the outside. There's, there's worldviews that are contrary to sound biblical doctrine, and they might sound that they're plausible. But the end result is that they're destructive. And they're out there. I'm warning you, church. That's what Paul is saying. But he's saying that they also creep within. What's happened in Europe that all those beautiful churches are now empty? What has happened that the great teachings of the Reformation have been forgotten? What is it that we have such a flimsy church now? What happened? What happened to the church in Ephesus? Well, we know because Paul tells us, he says, they're wolves amongst you. They're those who are teaching wrong teaching. He says, I hand them over to Satan. Those are his words. If we want to lead our church, we must be ready to warn our church. There's a threat on the outside. There's a threat on the inside. It's a matter of urgency. We live in this place, on this school, where the word of God has been preached. It can take a couple of years before it's gone before it's lost in ritual, before it's lost in a works-based religion. It can go in a very short time. When you take the baton of leadership, you Ephesians, take it very seriously. Because there are wolves out there. And they come in sheep's clothing. And they infiltrate. And they change the emphasis of the church. And before you know it, it's gone. They cause dissension and disruption. They take away your focus on the Lord Jesus Christ and they put it on something else. Paul is saying to the church, be careful. When I hand this baton over to you, I'm telling you already that it's going to happen because it happened to me. We're in the position 2,000 years ago where we can study what's happened in church history. We can see that it takes only a generation for them, for the love of Jesus to disappear. Make sure you hand the baton over. You mothers, make sure you hand it over to your children. You fathers, you hand it over to your family. And make it be a, with a sense of urgency. The next thing that he says to us, is he says you should study and you should pray. If you want to, be, if you want to do the right thing for your church, you should study and you'll pray. And I get that from where he says, 
And now, brethren, I commend you to God. What does he mean by I commend you to God other than that I pray to God? I bring you before God. With my hand on my heart, I commit that I would pray for this church. I would pray for the leaders in this church and the members of this church. I would present them to God. You see, because I'm aware that I can do nothing, but God can do everything. In everything, we take it before God. This should be a praying church. This should be a praying and a studying church. There's a way that Christians communicate with God. He speaks to us through His Word, with the enlightening of the Holy Spirit. We speak to Him as we speak to each other, other than the fact that He's God. He's sovereign, He's powerful, He's majestic, He's wonderful, He's all of these things. He's multidimensional. There's an awe and a reverence and a love for God, but we speak to Him as we speak to other people. He speaks to us through His Word. That's how He speaks. If we want to be a growing church, if we want to be the leadership, we must study and we must pray. I'm worried. My family in the church, when you don't study God's word, I'm worried when your knees are not calloused. I'm worried when you don't consider these things as important. Before all of else, you should, before all else, before you go and earn your money, before you do anything, before you lead your family, Study and pray. That's how you're going to grow. That's how we're going to grow as a church. That's how we're going to grow as individuals. Never treat this thing lightly. And if the impersonators of, of the devil are wolves in sheep's clothing, the devil himself is, you must be aware that the one thing that he does not want you to do is to study and pray. You must be aware of his schemes. He's going to do whatever he can to keep you away from his word, and away from your knees. But the place that you grow, the place where you feed the most, is when you study and when you pray. I'm coming to the end, I'm sorry. The next thing I find very interesting, and I've put it under the heading of freedom from self-interest. When we're serving, there needs to be a freedom from self-interest. And listen to the way that Paul puts it. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words of Jesus himself, it is more blessed to give than to receive. There's nothing that's going to put off people from a church where there's a, a leader at the top of the church who has a self-interest. We must be aware of these things. We want to be free to be able to present the gospel to people. We don't want them to be distracted by the side issues. We must take carefully in this church issues of morality. When our leaders are sexually or morality, we must, we must sort it out. When people have a love of money, we must sort it out. When people are arrogant and proud, we must sort it out. We must be the church that lovingly looks after each other to make sure that we're a pure and a blameless church. Don't let us be ever compromised. May it be that the only offense that someone hears when they come in through these doors is the offense of the gospel. May it be said of us that we're blameless. It's important for our church. And then lastly, I'd like to say that that the leaders of the church should testify to the gospel of God's grace. Almost after every chapter, that's what Paul says. That was the, the central part of my life, is that I testified to, to, the, um, to the good news of God's grace. This is a great church. It's a wonderful church. It's amazing that, that Carl brought up the whole issue of gratitude. To me, the two things that should happen to anybody who has an encounter with this Jesus is gratitude and humility. Humility that my eyes have been opened to the greatness of God. Humility to the fact that I've, I've rebelled against Him in totality. Gratitude that in spite of that, He's reached out to me and He's pulled me into the family in His grace. That is what I should testify, both personally and as a church. That Jesus Christ came into this world so that a dysfunctional world could find their purpose and their meaning in Him. They would not only find life, they would find everlasting life. They would not only find life, 
they'd find abundant life. And we have all of those things in this Jesus. It's a wonderful church. It's a glorious church. I'm so glad to be part of this body of believers. It is a great delight to me that I'm in the presence of people like Tracy and uh, Andres and Kevin and Jill. But one day, I will stand before my Jesus and I'll answer for my life. And I have to ask myself the question, will I have the double chastisement or will I have the double honor? I want to call to all of us that we'd follow the example of Paul and become good leaders within our community. Amen.